Hello and welcome to this webinar series on agricultural crop classification with synthetic aperture radar and optical remote sensing. I'm RSET trainer Erica Podest. I'm also a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This webinar series has five sessions and we've had the participation of amazing guest lecturers from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, the European Space Agency, and the research and user support from Copernicus. We've also had the support from our set trainers, Sean McCartney and Amita Mehta, to put this training together. Today's session is a refresher on synthetic aperture radar, touching on specific aspects related to agriculture. Our guest speaker is Dr. Heather McNairn from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Before we start, I want to give you a little bit of background about NASA's RCEP program, which is part of the Applied Sciences Capacity Building Program. And the goal is to empower the global community through online and in-person remote sensing trainings. Right now, they're just online because of the pandemic. And we have four thematic areas, water resources, air quality, disasters, and land. There is a new thematic area that is, uh, will be coming soon, which is on climate and energy. RSET's goal is to increase the use of earth science remote sensing data, as well as model data in decision making through trainings that are targeted to professionals in the public and private sector, environmental managers, policy makers, but also for those in academia or anyone really interested in using remote sensing for their specific application. All our set materials are freely available to use and adapt for any sort of curriculum. And um, if you do use our set methods and data presented in our trainings, we ask that you acknowledge the NASA R set program. The training format, there are five sessions and each one is two and a half hours long and that includes presentations and question and answer sessions. The same content will be presented at two different times each day. So session A will be presented in English and session B will be presented in Spanish. The training materials and the recordings will be available through the web page for this training. The homework and certificate, there will be one homework assignment associated with this training and all answers must be submitted via a Google form. The due date for the homework is November 2nd of this year. And a certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all life um, sessions and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. Uh, expect to receive the certificate of completion around two months after the completion of the course. And you'll be receiving the certificate from Marines Martins. The prerequisites for this training are the fundamentals of remote sensing and introduction to synthetic aperture radar. So you can find both links on this slide. The training outline. Today, we will provide a refresher on synthetic aperture radar. On Thursday, October 7th, we'll provide a refresher on optical remote sensing, as well as an introduction to SNAP, to the SNAP uh, software. On next Tuesday, on October 12th, we'll introduce a roadmap to operational crop classification using optical and SAR imagery. So that's gonna be two parts. First one is next Tuesday, and the second part of that roadmap will be presented next uh, on Thursday, October 14th. And finally, on October 19th, the last session, that's going to be focused on biophysical variable retrievals using optical imagery to support agricultural monitoring practices. The training objectives of this training is to learn the physics behind SAR image formation, the interaction of the SAR signal with the land surface, the impact of soil and crop characteristics on the SAR uh, signal, and the optimal sensor parameters for agricultural applications. <laughs> 
Now I'll hand it over to Dr. Heather McNair. As mentioned, she's a scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and she's an expert in the use of synthetic aperture radar for agriculture. This is her third RSET training, so we're extremely pleased that she is once again sharing her incredible knowledge and expertise with RSET participants. Thank you very much, Dr. McNair, and welcome. Thank you for that introduction. And I just want to remind everyone that what I plan to do in this webinar is to give a refresher of some of the basics around radar, and then we will discuss some of the applications of radar to agriculture. And if you have any additional questions um, or uh, pieces of information that you're looking for, I encourage you to go back and revisit some of the previous RSAT training. So let's get started in reviewing some of the radar basics. So I want to begin by reminding everyone about the differences between microwave remote sensing and remote sensing in other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So recall that microwave remote sensing is dealing with wavelengths uh, on the order of about one centimeter to one meter. And we can refer to these microwave regions either by their wavelength or their frequency. And frequency wavelength are used pretty interchangeably in the um, radar remote sensing literature. And on the right hand side, I have a table that illustrates the wavelength frequency um, of different regions of the microwave region. However, I'd like to just provide a little bit more context about the scale of these microwave uh, waves. And to do that, I just invite you to take a look at the diagram, the picture that I have on this slide. And I also invite you to extend your arms out just like I have in this illustration. And we're going to use the tips of our, finger, of our fingers as our starting reference point. If I measure from the tips of my finger to about halfway up my finger, about where your knuckle would be, that is approximately the size of an X-band microwave. If I move my, my hand at the wrist from my fingertip to the wrist, that's about the scale of a C-band microwave. And bending at the elbow, fingertip to elbow, is approximately the length of an L-band wave, and if I shrug my opposite shoulder, fingertip to opposite shoulder is about the upper limit of what a P-band wave uh, wavelength is. So you can see that the scales that we're dealing with in microwave remote sensing are much different than optical. And even between X-band and P-band, we have quite a range in terms of, of scales. And that's going to become important when we talk about how microwaves interact with targets. So just keep this diagram and this, uh, th this difference in scale in mind. So radars are active systems, and that simply means that they generate their own source of energy. And radar is an acronym, and that acronym radio detection and ranging tells us pretty much everything we need to know about a radar sensor. So radars do two things. The first thing that radars do is that they detect. So a radar will send or propagate a microwave or radar uh, radio signal with known properties. We know a lot about the signal that a microwave antenna sends. We know its polarization, its frequency. We know the angle that it's propagated at, and we know how much intensity and phase is associated with that wave that's propagated. Um, then the, the microwave signal interacts with the target on the Earth, and energy is scattered back and recorded by the sensor. And just keep in mind that it's not just the intensity of energy that is recorded by the radar antenna, but it's also other characteristics about that scattered wave, such as its phase, for example. But radars have another important role, and these sensors um, also range the target. What that means is that radars measure the time that it takes a microwave signal sent from its antenna to travel to the target, to the Earth, and then return back to the antenna. And this is really important information for uh, radar systems because this information in terms of time 
allows the radar to, uh, to range and locate uh, the target on the Earth. And that ranging is accomplished through uh, this simple equation where the range or distance in meters or kilometers from the radar antenna to the target is a function of the speed of light and the time that it takes that signal to, re to uh, go from the radar antenna to the Earth's surface and back again. So we divide by two because that's a two-way trip for that microwave. We're going to review as well the properties of um, radar systems. We'll start with frequency and wavelength, but I'll also touch upon polarization and incidence angle. But let's start with frequency and wavelength. The wavelength of a microwave uh, is the, the length of one wave cycle. And I have a simple diagram of a sine wave. We have the resting position of that wave and this sine wave, which is propagating through space and time. And the wavelength is simply the distance from one point on uh, the first wave to the subsequent equivalent point in the, the next uh, waveform. Uh, so here we're measuring it from the peak of one wave to the peak of the subsequent wave. But just a reminder that can be, wavelength can be measured from any point on one wave to the subsequent point on the next wave. Um, so frequency is another way that we characterize microwaves. Uh, so frequency is measured in hertz, and frequency uh, represents the number of oscillations per unit time. And Microwave and frequency are, inversely, are inversely related, and I've provided just a little schematic here to remind you of how to convert between wavelength and frequency through the speed of time. And a reminder that frequency um, in hertz, for example, one hertz being one cycle per second. So if we had three hertz, that would be, for example, three cycles per second. So as I was mentioning, we refer to microwave uh, waves either by frequency and wavelength, and we can easily convert uh, one to the other. Let's look a little bit more at the anatomy of a wave. Uh, so I have a, a sine wave that is propagating gain over space and time, and I draw your attention to this black horizontal line, which I'm going to refer to as the resting position of that wave. And I want it to just uh, review what amplitude and intensity means when we talk about uh, microwaves. Amplitude is the maximum displacement from this resting position to um, the maximum position on this wave. So this arrow represents the amplitude of this wave. Intensity is the average power transferred over one period of wave of the wave, and intensity is simply the amplitude squared. So I've come up with this little uh, diagram to just uh, re-emphasize uh, what we mean by amplitude and intensity. So I have this quiet uh, chirping bird um, and, and the, the waves generated by this quiet chirping bird are outlined uh, in represented by this red wave. And I have this loud mouth bird um, outlined in green and the wave generated by that loud mouth bird is represented in green. And we're going to assume that these birds start to chirp at exactly the same time and they chirp at the same frequency. So for example, maybe they chirp once every 10 seconds. And what we see is that the amplitude and the intensity of these waves are quite different. And you can imagine that the intensity and energy used by this loudmouth bird to generate this red wave, this uh, green wave is, is quite a bit greater than the intensity used to create this, the wave generated by this, this quiet bird. So just keep this diagram in mind as well when you're thinking about uh, the difference between uh, the intensity generated by different um, radar antennas. So we've talked about the wavelength or frequency um, of a wave and the intensity and the amplitude. Another really important characteristic of waves um, it, it is represented by the, the phase of the wave. And phase is simply the position of a point in time on a waveform cycle. And we can measure phase by either degrees or radians. So it's the wave's position in time or space. And on the right-hand side of this graph, um, I'm 
uh, of this slide, I'm showing um, a couple of waves that have been uh, generated. So let's just talk about this red wave, for example. So this red wave obviously has an amplitude uh, or intensity, but it also has a phase. So I can pick any point along this red wave and describe the position of that wave uh, in time or space by its phase. Uh, we can also uh, look at phase, uh, the phase of one wave relative to the phase of another wave. Um, so as I said, we've generated this, this red waveform and we've delayed uh, in generating this blue waveform. And if we just take a look at where, where this red and blue waveform cross its resting position, you can see that there is an offset in time or, or in space in terms of when this red wave crosses its resting position and when the blue wave crosses uh, the resting position. And this difference in time or in, in space is the phase difference between these two waves. So we would consider waves to be in phase if their origins at phase zero degree are perfectly aligned. And we can see that that's not the case and, and thus there's a phase difference between these two. But interestingly, even though these waves have different phases, they have equal uh, amplitudes or equal intensities. Uh, contrary to our quiet bird and our loudmouth bird, those two birds, as we talked about, have, are generating different uh, waves of different intensities. But you can see that both the green and the red wave cross that resting position at the same time. So these two waveforms have different amplitudes, but they have the same phase. So why is phase so important in radar? There are many reasons why phase is important. Uh, phase is important for interferometric applications of radar, and we need to know the phase if we want to generate polarimetric radar um, data sets. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning, when we generate a phase, we know when we generate a wave, we know a lot about the wave. We know the intensity, the frequency of the wave, the incidence angle, the polarization, and we know the phase of that wave that's being generated as well. But when a wave interacts with the target, lots of things happen. And one of the things that happens uh, when a wave interacts with a target is that the phase can change depending on the structure of the target. So if we send out a, a wave of a known phase and that wave comes back with a phase that's altered, that gives us clues about the target. So we can exploit that in our uh, data analysis. And as well, when we're generating a phase using a radar antenna, the offsets uh, in phase can determine how a wave propagates. So let's move on and talk about the polarization associated with uh, radar microwaves. Um, so a electromagnetic field is a synchronized oscillation of an electric and a magnetic field, which uh, propagates at the speed of light. And so a electromagnetic wave propagates because the electric field recreates the magnetic field and the magnetic field recreates the electric field. And so what that simply means is that we have both an uh, magnetic and electric field which are coupled together um, as this wave propagates um, at the speed of light. In microwave remote sensing, the uh, the reference that we use for polarization is the orientation of the electric field of that EM wave. So that's identified here, outlined in red. So let's talk a little bit about how waves propagate. And as you recall, I mentioned that phase is, one of the reasons phase is important because um, differences in phase will change how a wave propagates. And I'll remind everyone that most waves um, that we find in ambient in the environment, for example, sunlight, um, most of those waves are elliptically uh, polarized. And these waves are, are elliptically polarized because um, there is an offset between the vertical and the horizontal components of the EM field. And that offset is something other than 90 degrees. And when uh, we have an offset between horizontal and vertical components um, uh, at a difference other than 90 degrees, we have this elliptically propagating wave. And that phase difference causes the uh, wave to, to rotate as it propagates through space. And if we trace the, the tip 
of the um, electric field vector of this propagating wave, that that uh, wave will outline the shape of an ellipse. So most waves ambient that we find in the environment are propagating with this type of polarization. In radar remote sensing, we are pretty accustomed to using uh, linear polarizations and, and traditionally SAR sensors are propagating and receiving energy at a horizontal or vertical linear polarization. And these waves are um, special cases um, of, uh, of a waveform where the difference between the vertical and the horizontal component of EM field uh, is zero. So there's no phase offset and that wave uh, propagates in a, in a plane. There are some new sensors, uh, satellite radar sensors, which are propagating energy with, using circular polarization. So in some cases, you can select a circular polarization as um, a polarization on these, these uh, new radar systems. And these circular polarizations are generated by a radar antenna when the vertical and the horizontal components of the EM field are have an equal amplitude, but they are uh, specifically 90 degrees out of phase. And again, because there's a difference in phase between the horizontal and vertical components, that causes that propagating wave to rotate. And this time when we trace the, the shape of that electric uh, field vector as it's propagating through space and time, um, that vector is tracing the outline of a circle. Okay, so we've talked about how we can generate waves of different polarizations, traditionally linear, but um, in, in newer systems, we can also select circularly polarized waves. But we're not just generating waves from a radar antenna, we're also receiving waves that come back to us from the interaction uh, with a target. Um, so as I said, we send fixed waves of a fixed polarization, so we know what the polarization is, and we're measuring both the intensity and the phase of the energy that's scattered back. And I just want to remind you that uh, even though we send microwaves out with a fixed polarization, so let's say uh, for sake of argument, we send out a horizontally a linearly polarized wave, that wave will scatter in many different ways, especially with distributed targets like vegetation, and we will get um, uh, many different changes in phase and, and many different scattering um, components in, in many different directions. And so there's a lot of different scattering that occurs with these distributed targets. What the radar antenna does then is it listens, but it listens for something very specifically it's listening to find out and record how much energy that is scattered back to it in a very specific polarization. So for example, we can send out a horizontally polarized wave from the radar antenna, and we listen and record for how much of that energy comes back in a horizontal um, orientation. Uh, so as you know, we have uh, light polarizations, HH and VV and cross polarizations uh, where we send out, for example, horizontal wave and measure how much comes back vertically. But bear in mind that there's a lot of scattering that will occur in many different directions. So we've talked about uh, the polarization as well as the frequency and the, um, the wavelength. And the third way that we characterize radar wave propagation is the incidence angle. So incidence angle is the angle between the radar beam and a perpendicular to the image surface. And that's identified in this diagram. So we have a radar beam and we have a, a perpendicular or normal to the Earth's surface and this represents the incidence angle. And just like polarization and, and frequency, incidence angle has um, some really important implications for radar remote sensing. This angle determines a number of things. It will determine the contribution of different target elements uh, to backscatter. Uh, angle also determines how rough a target appears to the radar so that smoother surfaces will appear smoother at larger angles. And instance angle also determines how deep the microwave signal penetrates into the target. And we will explore some of these in greater detail. Um, both in this, this radar basics part, but also when we talk about applications of radar to agriculture. 
So let's delve a little bit more into incidence angle. Backscatter decreases with in increasing incidence angle. This is a fundamental concept, um, a fundamental property of propagating um, um, energy. Um, so that's, that's fundamental. However, the rate and the function of decrease uh, in backscatter with incidence angle is target specific. And as a result, when a radar is viewing the same target at different angles, the backscatter will be different. So let's explore that with this diagram and, and this, this picture I have on the right. So when we look at this, uh, this graph, we see that we have increasing incidence angle uh, in degrees and we have increasing backscatter on the y-axis. And just uh, before we get into the details, we see that regardless of the target, that there is a fundamental decrease in backscatter as angle increases. But I've, uh, I have three lines, uh, three functions, and we can see that the rate of decrease in backscatter with in increasing instance angle is not the same for all targets. So there is a difference in the rate and the function of those uh, that drop off in backscatter with angle. And most satellite SAR systems are operating in about 20 degrees to about 50 degrees, but you can see that even within that instance angle range, there is a difference in uh, backscatter with angle. So what that means is that regardless of the target or any changes in the target, uh, we will see this, this change in, in backscatter. Uh, so for example, for a smooth surface, like the one I have um, outlined here, so this is a pretty smooth agricultural field, um, as incidence angle decrease, uh, increases, the backscatter from this uh, target will, um, will decline simply as a function of this, this fundamental relationship. Um, if I have a surface that has more roughness to it, such as this one on the left, that rate of decline is, uh, is not as significant. So that means that these two targets will look different um, fundamentally because of the changes in incidence angle. And if I image either of these targets at different incidence angles, the backscatter will be different regardless of any changes in the target. I want to talk as well about the local incidence angle and to remind you that the local incidence angle is not the same as the incidence angle. Local incidence angle takes into uh, account the local slope of the terrain such that slopes towards the radar, the local incidence angle is less than the normal incidence angle assuming a flat surface. So that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so I'm going to take you to this diagram on the, uh, the upper right. So we have a radar antenna propagating a microwave towards, uh, um, towards the Earth. And let's just focus on an area in this target where the topography is pretty, uh, is pretty flat. And again, if we uh, draw our normal uh, to the Earth's surface and measure the angle between the radar beam and that normal, this is our incidence angle. But you can see on the slopes facing towards the radar antenna, if I again uh, use uh, draw a normal to the Earth's surface and look at the angle between the radar beam and that normal, the incidence angle is smaller. So recall the graph that I just showed you. There's a fundamental uh, decrease in backscatter as incidence angle increases. Um, so what does that mean? It means that uh, these forward-facing slopes, for example, the incidence angle is, is smaller, and that means that um, there's a difference in the, the backscatter for those, those, forward, um, uh, those forward slopes. And this matters because if we look at this picture at the bottom, we have an agricultural field. Um, so it looks like this is a field that has been harvested. Uh, the field looks to my eye looks pretty much the same across that, uh, that field, but we have some rolling topography. And what this incidence angle effect means is that if I am imaging um, slopes that are facing towards the radar antenna, that the backscatter will be higher for these forward facing slopes than, um, for example, um, areas of this field that uh, are, are flat to the radar. Um, so even though this field is uh, the target itself is the same across the field. We will have differences in backscatter due to changing incidence angle because of this, um, this effect, this fundamental effect. 
Okay, we're gonna move on now, talk a little bit about radar geometry. So recall that radars are side-looking instruments. This is an important characteristic of radar. We need radars to be side-looking so that we can locate and range the target. We have uh, two um, directions in radar remote sensing. We have um, the azimuth direction, which is the direction uh, parallel to the flight path if we're talking about an aircraft or parallel to the orbit of a satellite. And then the uh, direction which is perpendicular to this azimuth direction is the range direction. So we have two directions, azimuth and range, but we also have two different um, resolutions which we're going to talk about as well, an azimuth resolution and a range, a res, uh, range resolution. So radars, uh, so this is a radar system propagating its microwave uh, to the Earth to the target. Um, and, and the slant range is the distance between that radar antenna and its target. So we characterize uh, this as the slant range, uh, which is the natural viewing geometry of a radar system. If we, um, if we project that slant range uh, onto the, uh, the geoid of the Earth, um, this is now the range, uh, the ground range um, uh, uh, distance and direction. And I raise this because when you are downloading or ordering radar data, you can order data in, in either slant range or ground range often, um, but be aware it's important to know whether the applications that uh, you plan to apply to the radar data will uh, some of those will only be appropriate in, in slant range. Now, um, let's talk a little bit more about the radar geometry. So again, I mentioned we have an azimuth direction, which is the direction um, parallel to the flight path of an aircraft or parallel to the, the satellite orbit. Uh, the, the radar um, antenna is propagating uh, microwave energy perpendicular to that azimuth direction in the range direction. Slant range is the natural viewing geometry of the radar, and uh, ground range is um, the slant range prop, um, projected onto the Earth geoid. Um, we also have what we call a near range and a far range, um, and I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about this because this also has an impact on incidence angle. Um, so the, the incidence angle changes from the near range to the far range as we move across that swath. So recall incidence angle is the angle between the radar beam and a normal to the Earth's surface, but that incidence angle changes from the near range to the far range, such that at, uh, uh, in the near range we have a smaller or a steeper incidence angle, and in the far range we have a shallower or a larger incidence angle. So for example, we may be moving from 20 degree incidence angle out to 50 degree incidence angle. So that angle changes uh, with, uh, across the swath. And that's important, as I was just saying, because um, that, will, that change in incidence angle will fundamentally change the radar backscatter regardless of the condition of the target. So it's important to keep in mind that there's a change in angle across the range. Uh, something that you will note if you uh, look at slant range data as well is that there is compression um, in the targets displayed in slant range. So remember slant range is the natural viewing geometry of the radar. That's how the data is collected by these microwave um, uh, systems. Um, but the distances are compressed relative to their true ground range distance. The degree of compression is a function of the distance from the antenna to the, uh, to the target in slant range. To illustrate that, I, I uh, drew this diagram. Uh, so we have two fields, field A and field B. So if we look at the ground range, um, so the true geometry of these fields, these fields are the same size um, on the Earth's surface. But if we project those um, up onto the slant range, we can see that both fields, field A and field B, that the uh, both the, the the size of those fields are compressed, but the but field A is more compressed because it's closer to the radar antenna in slant range than field B. So uh, to illustrate that, I'm just displaying here a slant range image. So if you order a slant range image, you will see this compression. 
The degree of compression depends a lot on the size of the, the swath uh, in, in range direction. So this is a radar set two image. So the swath of this radar set two quad pole image is pretty small. It's about 50 kilometers from, this is the near range in this image to the far range. So it's about 50 kilometers um, across range. Um, but I will draw your attention to this field, to this, uh, this river system. So we have a, um, a small river and then a couple of tributaries that, uh, that branch off from this main river. So there's some compression happening, especially in the, the near range due to this slant range view of, of the earth. It's uh, pretty easy to convert from slant range to ground range. We can do that through resampling. This requires knowledge of the imaging geometry, the platform altitude, the range delay, and uh, you need information on the terrain elevation as well. For example, a digital elevation model. Most commercial or open source software have um, an algorithm or a tool that will gather up all of this information from the metadata or the header information on the, the radar data and will apply this slant to grand range conversion for you. Uh, and so now we can pick, compare in the Grand Range, we can look at this river system, um, so the main river and then a couple of tributaries, and we can see that um, the display in Ground Range now reflects the, the true uh, ground uh, geometry of this river system. Uh, so pretty easy conversion from slant range to ground range. So let's go back and visit a little bit about incidence angle now that we've talked about uh, near range and far range. Uh, so remember I talked about um, the fact that the incidence angle changes from the near range to the far range. And that change in incidence angle from near to far range uh, depends on the, um, depends on the, uh, the, the radar mode itself, um, but also that range, um, the size of the range distance. So for large uh, swath modes, and you can think of Scansar as being an example of that, um, these are very large swaths, 300, 500 kilometers in range direction. There is a pretty significant change in incidence angle from the near range to the far range. So in this example uh, is showing for, uh, that for a wide swath radar mode, we could have a near range incidence angle of 20 degrees and a far range incidence angle of, for example, 45 degrees. And thinking back to that graph that I showed uh, earlier, Fundamentally, the backscatter changes because, because incidence angle changes. So this is important if we have a target in the near range and the far range that are similar. And uh, I'll use a cornfield as an example. If we have a cornfield which is in the same growth stage, has the same amount of biomass, is the same height, for example, um, if we have a field like that in the near range and we have a field like that in the far range, those fields are exactly the same. Um, the backscatter will not be the same for those two fields because of this change in backscatter due to incidence angle. So we have to think a little bit about that when we're using wide swath uh, radar data. Uh, for classification, for example, you can think about collecting training da data in the near range and training data in the far range so that you adequately represent the backscatter for those cornfields. Um, or if you're doing modeling, you have to make sure that you have some way to compensate or to model the, the uh, impact of incidence angle on radar backscatter. Another thing I wanted to talk about is this issue of satellite revisit versus satellite relook. So revisit is when a satellite images uh, a point on the Earth in the exact same geometry. So we can think about, uh, as an example, radar set two has an exact revisit of 24 days. So that means that every 24 days, if we select the same radar mode, that satellite will look at my target with the exact same geometry, the exact same incidence angle. Um, but of course, sometimes we don't wanna wait for the revisit. We want a more temporally rich data set. Um, and in that case, we want to steer the radar antenna to look we look at our target more often than every 24 days, for example. Um, so yes, we can electronically steer our radar beam to relook at the target more frequently, but we have to keep in mind that these relooks will likely have a different 
uh, incidence angle. So again, that incidence angle is going to impact the radar backscatter. So we have to think a little bit about this, especially when we're, we're trying to do multi-temporal analysis or change detection. We have to be careful about this incidence angle impact. So if we're going to combine imagery, uh, if we combine imagery with the same incidence angle, that will ensure that changes that we see in backscatter are, are fundamentally related to changes in the target and are not being driven by this, um, this fundamental characteristic of dropping, drop in backscatter due to angle. Um, and if you are combining data uh, with different incidence angles, um, as I said, you have to think about how are you going to model or compensate for that change. Let's move on and talk about uh, the resolution of radar data. And uh, just recall that, that the spatial resolution of uh, radar data is not determined in the same way that, that optical resolutions are. And we have to get comfortable with the fact that the resolution of radar systems have nothing to do with how close or how far away the antenna is to our target. Uh, so resolution in radar is determined in a, in a much different way. We're going to talk about range resolution and then we'll move on to, um, to azimuth resolution. So as a reminder, uh, range is that uh, distance or direction perpendicular to the flight path or the orbit of the satellite. Um, and remember, we're talking about slant range because that's the natural viewing geometry of the radar system. So how is slant range resolution determined? Uh, that resolution in the range direction is um, related to the bandwidth um, measured in hertz. So there's an inverse relationship uh, between bandwidth and range uh, resolution. Uh, so what is this bandwidth in hertz? Well, bandwidth is inversely related to the pulse duration tau represented in this case. And the pulse duration uh, simply is the time that the radar's transmitter is energized during each cycle. So there's this relationship. Uh, if we have a large bandwidth, we have a short pulse duration and a short pulse length, and that provides a finer resolution. So this diagram provides a convenient way to look at that. Um, with a wide bandwidth um, provides a short pulse duration and a finer radar resolution in the range direction. Uh, so recall we were talking about how radars send out pulses of energy and they listen. So I always think about it this way. We send out a short pulse of energy, we wait, and we listen for the echo that comes back from the target in between these transmitted pulses. So it makes a lot of sense that for radar to be able to distinguish between two targets, the echoes that come back from that, uh, those two targets have to come back at different times. So if we look at the diagram on the right, we have two buildings, building A and we have building B. Um, so in this case, um, in order for the radar to be able to distinguish between um, building A, building B, remember we want to range or locate them, but we also want to know what the intensity um, or, or backscatter properties are of these two buildings. If we send out a pulse, um, for the radar to hear the echoes from building A and building B separately, we don't want them merged together. The distance between building A and building B um, in slant range must be larger than half the pulse length. So the pulse length L divided by two because we're sending and then we are receiving. So the range resolution is equal to L over two half that pulse length. We can increase the range resolution um, by um, improving or increasing the bandwidth. So we saw that earlier. Um, and, and just recall, if we have a larger bandwidth, uh, we're reducing the length or the duration of the pulse of the radar. Shorter wavelengths will enable higher bandwidths. So this is why on X-band radar versus L-band radar, we have a difference in the, the resolution. Uh, there, there's another technique called pulse compression, which is a signal processing technique that can be applied to improve upon sort of this fundamental relationship between the, the pulse length and the range resolution. 
Okay, so uh, let's talk about the other dimension, which is the azimuth di direction uh, dimension. So this is the resolution in the a long track um, dimension, the, the uh, dimension that is parallel to the flight direction or orbit. And we're gonna talk about a real aperture radar uh, to, begin, to begin with to simplify um, the description of the azimuth resolution. And then I'm gonna talk about the, uh, a synthetic aperture radar. So the azimuth resolution um, depends on the beam width and the range. So remember the range is the distance from the antenna and slant range to the target. And this beam width is related to the radar uh, wavelength and D, which is the physical length of the radar antenna. So we're gonna really focus on this physical length of the radar antenna. And what this relationship tells us is that we can uh, improve our azimuth resolution with a longer antenna. However, you can imagine that designing, building, launching, deploying, operating a very large antenna in space can be uh, engineering a challenge and can be quite prohibitive. So this D um, parameter, this antenna length is really limiting um, how we can improve our azimuth resolution. So if we're limited by the physical length of the antenna, what can we do to improve the azimuth resolution? So that's where the synthetic um, aspect of, of SAR comes in. Uh, so in the 1950s, there was a um, realization that the Doppler shift of the echo signal could be used to synthesize a much lar larger aperture to improve the resolution of a side-looking radar. So another mouthful uh, in, in uh, the radar basics. So let's talk a little bit what this Doppler shift uh, is all about. And to do that, I have a very simple diagram on the right-hand side of the slide. So let's talk about the top diagram. So I want you to imagine a bug, and this bug is sitting on a, a pond of water. And this bug is ex in exactly in the center of this, this pond of water. And the distance from this bug to point A on one shoreline and the distance between this bug and point B on another shoreline, this distance is exactly the same. So the bug is exactly the same in, in the center and the same distance from A and B. Now imagine that this bug starts to move its legs and at, when it moves its legs, it creates ripples or waves in this pond. And we're going to imagine that this bug moves its legs um, at a set frequency. So, for example, the bug moves its legs once every 10 seconds, and it creates these, uh, these waves. And because the bug is the same distance from point A and point B, these waves, one, one wave every 10 seconds, will hit point A and point B at exactly the same time. Okay, so let's look at the bottom. Let's imagine that this bug decides that it's gonna move and it will move towards a point B. So the bug is still moving its legs at exactly the same frequency. It's creating a, a ripple, a wave in the pond once every 10 seconds. So the frequency at which these waves are being created by the bug is the same. But you can see that the bug is moving towards point B. And this forward movement or this movement of this bug is uh, changing the frequency at which these waves hit point B. And you can see that the time between uh, when each wave hits point B and the frequency at which these waves hit point B is increasing. And this is quite simply um, an example of what we mean by the Doppler shift. And I have a little animation at the bottom here just to show this in sort of real time. So we have a source of a wave, think about a bug. And you can see that as this source of the wave is moving um, uh, towards a forward observer, that the frequency at which these waves are hitting that forward observer are increasing. And the frequency or the time between the waves hitting the back observer is, is decreasing. So this again is the Doppler shift. So now that we understand the Doppler shift, how is that used to improve the azimuth resolution? So of course, we're not talking about bugs on the pond, we're talking about radars in, in space, but radars are also sending out co constant pulses of energy. So just like the bug moving once every 10 seconds, we have a radar sending out constant pulses at a set frequency. 
And just like our bug on the pond, the radars are also moving. They're orbiting the Earth. So what does that mean for targets on the Earth? So if we look at the diagram on the right-hand side, we see a red box. So that's our target. So as this radar um, is passing, um, is, is, is moving over this target, the first echoes um, of this uh, radar, um, of, of this radar beam that is the first echoes of the uh, radar that is set towards this target have a positive Doppler shift. So again, think about our bug, the fact that the, the pulses are um, increasing in frequency relative to the target. When the antenna is right over the target, there is no Doppler shift. Um, and then there's a negative Doppler shift as the target exits the echo. So think about the frequency at which the echoes reach the target as um, as a source of the energy is moving away, that that frequency is decreasing. Okay, so we understand the Doppler shift. Um, we know that that can uh, apply to orbiting satellites as well. So how do we exploit that to create a improved azimuth resolution? Uh, so we're gonna think about, or we're gonna look at this diagram at the bottom. We have a ship. We have a, a ra uh, aircraft with a radar on it setting up pulses of energy, um, and we have these sub-beams, sub-beam A, B, C, and D. Uh, so SARS uh, record all of these Doppler um, shifts. Um, as we are approaching upward shift in Doppler, zero Doppler shift when we're right over the target, and then a shift down in the Doppler as, we, uh, as the, the target exits the final echoes of that radar system. So the radar and the SAR processor record and exploit all of those signals. And we record all of the signals for a set period of time from the time that the target first enters the very first echoes of the radar to when the target exits the final echoes of the target, uh, um, of the, um, the microwave pulse. So we record all of that for a period of time T from, in this case, points A to D. And remember, these all have uh, these all these sub pulses all have different Doppler shifts. Um, these Doppler shifts are used to reconstruct a signal that would have been obtained if the antenna had a length equal to V, which is the velocity of the, um, the radar uh, antenna, the aircraft or the, the satellite, and T, which is the length of time with, for which those uh, radar echoes are interacting with the target. Uh, making T large, that time large, so the time that the target is seen by the radar antenna um, makes the synthetic aperture radar quite large. So now we're not talking about a real aperture radar, a real physical radar. We're talking about stitching together the knowledge of all of these Doppler shifts to create a synthetic aperture. And now that we have this synthetic aperture, which is quite large, Time, which is equivalent to a long virtual antenna and a high azimuth resolution. So that the achievable, and at the end of the day, the achievable azimuth resolution is approximately equal to one half the length of the real, um, the real antenna, the real aperture. So now let's talk a little bit about the radar reflectivity. So as you recall, I was talking about a radar system sending out one unit of energy. That's a convenient way of thinking about the propagation of energy from a radar antenna. And recall we talked about the fact that if we send out one unit of energy and that microwave signal interacts with a distributed target, especially uh, vegetation, we can have scattering in many different directions. So even though we send out one unit of energy, for most distributed targets, we won't get one unit of energy back. We'll get something less than one unit. And we need a way to, um, to a metric to, to measure this reflectivity. And there are three uh, ways to express re reflectivity. And we're, we're going to go through those right now. The first way is uh, an expression uh, called beta naught. And beta naught is uh, measuring the reflectivity per unit area. So we can think about one meter by one meter, for example. But we're measuring that reflectivity, that intensity per unit area in slant range. And recall that slant range is the natural viewing geometry of the radar. This diagram provides a great representation of these different reflectivities. 
And so beta naught is that reflectivity in slant range, and it's represented by this, um, this box outlined in black. This is the default reflectivity of a radar because slant range is its naturing viewing geometry. And because we are working in slant range, we do not require any knowledge of the local incidence angle. Uh, however, you will note in the radar literature that uh, some scientists prefer to express reflectivity uh, with uh, the expression of gamma, of gamma naught. A gamma naught is, again, a normalized reflectivity per unit area. Again, think about one meter by one meter. Uh, but this time we are expressing that reflectivity in an orthogonal to the slant range. So if we go back to our diagram, this is uh, the area outlined in red and uh, colored in yellow. So this is the gamma naught reflectivity per unit area expressed in uh, a plane that is orthogonal to the slant range. Plots of gamma as a function of incidence angle tend to be more consistent than comparable plots using sigma naught. And some researchers have found that gamma naught can reduce the incidence angle dependency of the radar backscatter. It's very easy to transform between these different reflectivities, and I've provided those expressions on this slide. So beta naught, the natural um, viewing geometry and reflectivity of a radar, we can transform um, beta naught into gamma naught using the tan of theta, theta being the incidence angle of the, uh, the radar beam. Uh, however, most of the time in the literature, we will uh, see expressions of reflectivity using sigma naught. Uh, so sigma naught, again, is a normalized reflectivity per unit area. Um, but this time we are uh, expression, expressing that reflectivity in an area that is um, illuminated horizontal uh, in the ground range, um, in the ground range uh, uh, direction. And again, if we go back to our diagram, uh, sigma naught is uh, outlined in purple and shaded in gray. So the reflectivity uh, in the horizontal ground plane. Here we're assuming a flat surface, so there's no topography uh, incorporated in uh, this expression. And um, as I said, it's uh, a parameter that we, it's a way of expressing backscatter or intensity uh, that we most often see in the radar literature. But we are impacted by uh, local surface slopes because we are transforming the, this reflectivity from slant range to ground range. And again, we can convert between beta naught, the natural viewing geometry and reflectivity of a radar, into sigma naught through this simple expression, the sine of theta, which is the incidence angle of the radar. I want to talk a little bit about this issue of decibels and why in radar we, we transfer, transform our backscatter into decibels. And we do that because radars are able to measure um, the backscatter from targets uh, that represent huge ranges, uh, dynamic ranges in backscatter. And a convenient example of this is if we think about a water body um, and an urban area right on the coastline. So the backscatter from our water body will likely be quite low. So if I send out one unit of energy from my radar antenna, very little of that energy will be scattered back if the water is, is smooth and calm. But in our urban area, we'll have a lot of reflections, a lot of um, double belt bounce scattering, and we will have a great deal of that energy that we send out coming back to the radar. So we have a huge range in intensities and backscatter um, in a single scene, for example, if we have a urban area next to um, a calm water body. So we have these, these great ranges in radar intensity. Uh, so the radar measures that intensity. Um, as I said, remember, we're sending at one unit of energy. Usually for most distributed targets, the amount of energy coming back is going to be a fraction of that between zero and one. Um, but to better represent the wide range in backscatters that we may get in uh, our radar uh, imagery, um, we like to transform that backscatter measured by the radar antenna, antenna in intensity units into a logarithmic scale um, expressed as decibels or dB. 
And it's quite easy to transform our intensity, radar intensity data into um, the logarithmic scale to better represent these wide ranges in backscatter using the formulas that I've provided on this slide. And I just draw your attention to, uh, there's a, a different formula if we're using amplitude or intensity. So recall amplitude is um, the distance from the wave's resting position to the um, maximum um, height of that wave, and intensity is the, the square of the amplitude. So pay attention to how you transform your intensity to backscatter depending on whether your data is expressed in amplitude or in intensity. I want to touch a little bit upon a speckle or noise in, in radar data. So this is very common, the salt and pepper um, appearance of radar data. So let's just talk a little bit about why we see speckle in, in radar. And I draw your attention to the diagram on the right-hand side of this slide. And we um, have two resolution cells or two pixels if you want to think of it that way. So pixel one and pixel two. And we have some targets inside of each of these pixels. And uh, I'm just going to refer to these triangles as trees. So let's assume in pixel one we have um, nine trees distributed in pixel one and we also have nine trees uh, uh, distributed in pixel two but you can see that they're not distributed in the same way and recall that radars are coherent systems and what that means is that a, a radar does not only measure the amount of energy that's scattered but it also um, measures the phase of the reflected energy so the amount of energy that comes back from pixel one is a vector sum, and it's a sum of both the intensity and the phase of each of these different scattering elements. But the way that these scattering elements, the intensity and phase adds up for, from pixel one to pixel two is, is not always the same. And you can see that the, you can see the vector sum here. So in pixel one, just the way that these individual elements within the pixel line up, we have a, a lower backscatter when we sum the intensity and the phase of these individual scattering elements. And in pixel B, the distribution is such that when we add the uh, back, the, um, the radar response in intensity and phase that we have a higher response. So we can have two resolution cells, two pixels that have the same number of trees, and we can have a different backscatter because of this, this vector sum in intensity and phase. So that creates this salt and pepper um, appearance in radar data. Uh, as we know, there are many different ways to deal with speckle in radar um, to help mitigate or reduce the effects of radar uh, speckle. Uh, we can multi-look the data. Uh, so sometimes when you're ordering data, you can make a selection between single look and multi-look data. So that's one uh, reason to select multi-look data is to reduce the speckle. And we can also average either spatially or temporally. Keep in mind, however, if you multi-look or spatially average uh, a radar uh, image, Yes, you reduce the noise, the speckle, but that will be uh, that will come at a, at a cost, and the cost is a reduction in the resolution. If we multi if we multi temporal um, speckle average, that's a different approach. So in that case, we are stacking um, a, a temporal sequence of radar imagery on top of each other, and we are averaging a pixel through time. So that's a good way to reduce speckle without reducing the resolution, uh, but that it depends on the application um, and the purpose of the analysis being undertaken and whether temporal averaging over time makes sense for your application. Uh, so I think in some of the next, the subsequent RSAT training, uh, you will learn a little bit more about uh, spatial spectral, uh, spatial speckle um, applications. Um, so how to apply spatial filtering to reduce speckle. But I did want to touch upon multi-looking because as I said, uh, when you acquire or order, download satellite SAR imagery, um, sometimes you have a choice between a multi-look and a single look image. So what is this multi-looking all about? So let's start with talking about a single look image. So with a single look image, all of the signal that's returned from a target is used to create a single image. Uh, so the image has noise, has speckle in it, but it has the highest achievable resolution if we uh, if we work with single look imagery. 
However, um, we can also take independent images. I like to think about this as taking the, the radar signal and slicing it up into different looks. Um, so if we have different images of the same area, um, we can do that in, in uh, signal uh, digital processing to create these subsets or these slices of the signal. Each of the subsets forms a separate image, a separate look at the target, um, but with a different, um, looking at that target with a different angle. So different slices, but looking at the target with a different angle. So what we're doing effectively is we're splitting that synthetic aperture D that we talked about when we talked about azimuth resolution, and we're splitting it into L non-overlooking um, sections or slices. Um, but that means that um, each of those have an effective um, aperture length of D um, over L, and the resolution is degraded by a factor of L. So uh, what that means in summary is that uh, if we multi-look our image by five, so we're slicing uh, that single look image into um, different uh, sub-images, if we multi-look by factor five, we will reduce the resolution by a factor five. So this is the trade-off between noise reduction and resolution. So multi-look imagery are independent images averages to create, create it, uh, that are averaged to create a multi-look image. So again, they have um, reduced speckle, but at the expense of resolution. So this is a trade-off when you're working with radar data that you will have to make. And I just have a final slide on the basics part of this webinar to talk about radar uh, geometric distortions. And RSAT, previous training with RSAT covers this quite extensively, so I just want to revisit it with one slide. Uh, so we talked about radars or side-looking instruments. Um, and because they're side-looking in instruments, it can create some distortions um, in the radar uh, response due to the, the geometry of the Earth. Um, in the extreme example, uh, for example, um, depending on the angle um, of the, 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 length, the angle at which the radar is propagating its energy, so it's, its uh, incidence angle. Um, we can have, if we have severe topography, significant topography, um, it, we can have a situation set up where the radar is not able to see um, at the uh, sort of the back side of the, the topography. So there's no signal that is returned from the, the um, uh, the back end of this uh, this topographic relief, and that that forms a radar shadow. Um, one strategy that you can try to overcome that uh, that lack of information is to acquire data at a at a different um, at a different orbit. So you can look at ascending and descending, and it may be that in one orbit you're able to see one side of the topography, on, and on another orbit you're able to see the other side. So that's one strategy that could be um, could be exploited. We have a couple of other distortions, though. Um, we have this distortion called foreshortening. And recall, we talked about what radars do. They range, um, and they detect the location of their target by sending out a pulse of energy and measuring the time that it takes for that energy to come back. And through the, um, the speed of light, uh, it can take that time and figure out exactly where its target is. So imagine a case where um, we send out this pulse of radar, and yes, the radar hits the bottom of this uh, this mountain area first, and the top um, second. But the time that it takes for that signal to hit the bottom and return and hit the top and the return is not reflective of the true geometry of the Earth. And what that happens, what happens, or how how that's manifested in the radar uh, imagery is that this this forward slope is compressed, so the geometry is not truly represented, or the true geometry is not properly represented on the radar image. And of course, the extreme example is layover. And again, remember the radar is detecting its target by the time it takes uh, for the signal to propagate and come back again. So in layover, what happens is that um, the radar um, beam hits the top of the topography before it hits the bottom of the topography. And so the radar thinks, because that signal comes back sooner, that um, this location on the Earth is closer to it, and that causes this layover effect. So those are some um, things to think about uh, in terms of geometric distortions and, um, and, and radar imagery. We're going to move now and talk about, now we've kind of had a refresher of all of the basics 
about radar. We talked about um, wavelengths and frequency, polarization, incidence angle, how resolution is the term, azimuth and range. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, how radar um, responds to agricultural targets. We're going to talk about soils and crops. So let's start um, back at the beginning and talk about wavelengths and frequency. So remember, these are interrelated. You can convert between wavelength and frequency um, using the, the speed of light. Um, and I'm just reminding you of that conversion uh, here with this diagram. Uh, so I often get asked this question, what is the best frequency um, if I want to map soils or crops? And um, that is a, a difficult question to answer because it depends. And remember, we stretched out our arm at the very beginning of this webinar and we took a look at the scale between X, C, L, and P band. Um, and we have to think about the wavelengths of the propagating energy relative to the target. So I like to say that everything in radar is relative. Uh, so we have to consider the size of the target elements rate relative to the radar frequency. So the target elements, for example, could be um, on vegetation. It could be the size of its leaves, um, the orientation of the leaves, the size of the stalks, these types of things. So think about the size of these elements of the target and the scale of the frequency or wavelength. Um, to maximize scattering, you know, ideally, we want to select wavelengths that are comparable in size or smaller than the elements. So again, it's a very relative uh, relationship. Um, we also have to ask ourselves the question, is it important to penetrate into the target or is the goal to maximize scattering at the surface of that target? Um, so sometimes we think it's better to penetrate, but that's not always beneficial. And I'm going to talk about that in, in just a second. Uh, so the simple relationship is that lower frequencies or longer wavelengths will provide greater penetration. So ask the question whether it's beneficial to have the energy coming from lower in the target, or is it better to have that energy scattering from the top part of the target? Um, so, and is the goal to maximize or minimize sensitivity to surface roughness? So low frequency wave will see a surface as smooth while a high frequency wave will see the same surface as rough. And we're gonna take a look at, at, at an example of that in just a second. So what is the best frequency for agriculture? As I said, I get asked this a lot and it really depends. Um, the, the one application that's a little bit clearer, a little bit straight, more straightforward is soil moisture. And that's because generally we want greater penetration into the soil because we wanna know the water in a bigger soil volume. So longer wavelengths like L-band, P-band that penetrate further um, into the soil are more beneficial. And these longer wavelengths can also penetrate through a crop canopy and, and get at the soil response. For um, other applications like crop classification and biophysical modeling, so if we want to know something about biomass, for example, it really depends on the crop canopy. So we have to think about where is it most beneficial for this scattering to come from? Is it the top part of the canopy? Is it the, the central part of the canopy? Um, and what is the size of that canopy? So a corn canopy and um, a soybean canopy do not have the same biomass. Um, and so if we use an L-band sensor to image a soybean versus a corn canopy, you can think about the center of scattering will be different within those two canopies. Um, and we don't want so, so much penetration into the, the vegetation canopy that we're getting contributions from the soil because that's just going to complicate any retrieval of the of the above ground um, canopy if we have this soil interference in the backscatter. Um, so really in radar remote sense in, in radar remote sensing applied to agriculture, the integration of data from different frequencies is very, very interesting and is probably um, the one radar parameter that will be the most beneficial to exploit. And I'm just showing here a simple example of that. So this is from a study site in, in Canada, one of our major study sites in Manitoba. And uh, what we've done here is we have integrated uh, from uh, one date, um, July 9th or July 10th, 
and one polarization, but with different frequencies. So we have X band from Terrasar X, C band from RadarSat 2, and L band from Allos. Uh, so one polarization from each and all uh, basically on uh, within a day of each other. And we can see that just with one, uh, you know, one date of data, we have significant um, differentiation between these different crop types. And it's through this integration, different frequencies that we are able to uh, separate one crop type from another. And it's interesting because what you see, uh, if you just sort of stand back and look overall at this image, we see that there's a lot of uh, a strong response coming from, from Terrasar X, from the, the X band. And because we're talking about X band, we have less penetration into the target. And, and that's interesting. Um, you know, I was looking at this cornfield, for example, uh, where we have a, a pretty bright response from Terrasar X for the corn. And we see at this time of year, the corn is starting to tassel. And uh, so sometimes, for example, we want interaction at the top part of the canopy because that's where the fruit of the canopy is. And sometimes that fruit development helps us distinguish one crop type from another. But we have other instances, for example, in canola, where we have um, a lot of response from C-band radar sat and a bit of contribution from the L-band allos as well. So it's really through how those different frequencies interact with the structure in these canopies that helps us to clearly identify one crop type from another. Uh, so, you know, multi-temporal data is the most important thing in, in agricultural monitoring. And then as I just demonstrated, integrating data from multiple frequencies or wavelengths is a really good strategy for agricultural uh, remote sensing using radar. But let's talk about polarization because we also have an ability to select the polarization um, which we want to image these agricultural targets. Um, so we have to think again in a relative sense, what is the polarization that the radar uh, is propagating? Um, and what is the orientation of that transmitted microwave relative to the target component? So again, think about the leaves and the stalks of my target. How are they oriented? And, you know, in a general sense, when we think about vegetation, a lot of vegetation has a dominant vertical structure. And that means that if we send out those linearly polarized waves um, at, a, v, um, at a, a vertical polarization, vertical orientation, you can imagine that those vertically transmitted waves are going to align with these vertical structures and create more scattering. Uh, if we send out a horizontally polarized wave, less of that energy um, is going to act, interact with the vertical structure, um, and, and we often see more contributions from the soil because there's less coupling of a horizontal wave with a vertical structure. But what's most interesting in uh, vegetation mapping is this cross-polarization term. Um, so remember I said if I send out a horizontally transmitted wave and it interacts with vegetation, I get scattering in many different directions. Um, and we can, tr we can exploit that scattering in different directions using the cross pole. So uh, in that, this case, the radar is sending out a horizontal polarization and it's listening how much of that energy is coming back vertically polarized. And it turns out in vegetation, a lot of it comes back verti vertically polarized. Um, and so vegetation sets up this really nice um, repolarization of energy from one polarization to another. And that's what this cross pull term is, uh, is measuring. Um, so in agricultural monitoring from our experience in some of our operations in Canada and from what's published by others in the literature, we know that this, this repolarization of horizontal into vertical or vertical into horizontal the radar listens for those that cross polarization, and that is the single best polarization for um, identifying crops or even to estimate biophysical properties of crops like biomass. And this coupling of the vertically polarized wave with the vertical structure is the second best polarization. So in Canada, for example, uh, we uh, we primarily rely on dual pole VVVH data uh, to do our our agricultural monitoring for Canada because of this, this um, dynamic that's set up with the transmit and receive polarization. 
Uh, let's talk about the target and what drives the scattering. So we touched upon the frequency and the polarization. Uh, so that's the characteristics of the radar itself, but let's talk about the target. Um, so what happens when a radar microwave interacts with, with an agricultural target? There are two fundamental characteristics of any target as well as agricultural targets that drive radar response. Um, and I put them in this specific order, uh, structure, roughness, and then water content in, in terms of their sort of dynamic range. We definitely have to have water in a target in order to create scattering, um, but it's really the structure or the roughness that determines the, the scattering direction and how much energy comes back to the radar. So let's take a look a bit at why that is. So in, um, in radar remote sensing, we characterize the roughness of the target by two statistical measures. One is the root mean square variance, um, and the other is the correlation length. So I want to talk about RMS first. RMS is the statistical variation of the random component of the surface height relative to a reference surface, and RMS will be expressed in millimeters or centimeters. And so our reference surface, for example, you can see it here. Uh, we have, think about an agricultural field with some roughness on it. This is our, our reference surface, and RMS is just simply measuring the average variation um, about that reference surface. So it's a characterization of how rough a field is. Uh, we can have periodic structures as well. So uh, sometimes certain tillage implements will create these, these periodic structures, or even um, planting rows can create periodic structures. And in that case, to calculate RMS, we, uh, you know, we fit a, um, a polynomial through um, that periodic structure and, and then calculate the random roughness. So this is just a guy um, tilling his field, and we can see that uh, he is creating roughness, and we can measure um, the, uh, the RMS uh, roughness in millimeters or centimeters of that, of that field. Uh, the other important parameter to think about is the correlation length. Um, so this is an autocorrelation function that measures the statistical independence of surface heights um, at two points separated by, um, by a distance. Uh, so you can think about this as measuring the, the surface roughness um, of, a, of a field and then sliding that measure of surface roughness incrementally along. And then we are measuring between uh, one and minus one. Um, the spatial correlation of one point on that surface to, um, uh, to the points um, subsequent to that, that measurement. So that's what correlation length is, is measuring. Um, so the length itself is equal to the displacement distance. Uh, so at what distance, distance do, does the correlation um, uh, fall to one over E? So E is um, Euler's number represented here. So we're trying to figure out at what distance in space are two points in terms of their roughness no longer correlated. So if you can think about a perfectly smooth surface, think about um, uh, an airport runway, for example, if we measure the roughness, you know, pretty much every point along that, um, that, that airport runway, the height is going to be correlated with the point previous to it. And in that case, on these very smooth surfaces, the height of every point is, is correlated with every other point, and that means that our correlation length is very large. Inversely, if we have very rough surfaces, you can imagine it doesn't take a very uh, long distance, it's a very short distance before the roughness um, uh, of those surfaces are no longer correlated. So in agriculture, what does that mean? So you can think about two scenarios. Here we have um, someone uh, who has tilled this agricultural field, but we can see that the field um, is pretty smooth. So the random roughness, um, the RMS values would be quite low here if we measured the statistical variation about a reference surface. Um, and if we measured the roughness um, at a point here, and then we measured it at, at a point um, a little bit further away, that the, the roughness of these two points is pretty correlated. And so we would have a very uh, large or long correlation length. Um, conversely, if we start to till the field, you can imagine measuring the random roughness um, about a reference surface here, we, we would have a much greater variation, so a higher RMS value. And if we measured the roughness um, in two points, it wouldn't take a very long distance before the roughness is no longer correlated. 
So that's how we measure roughness. So let's uh, talk a little bit about what this means uh, as it relates to um, the incidence angle and the frequency of a radar. So recall, I always mentioned that uh, everything in radar is relative. And so we have to think about roughness as a relative term as well. And it's relative to both the angle and the radar frequency. And we can express this relatively, relativity through the Rayleigh roughness criterion that's expressed here. So H is the, the height. I think about this as the height that the radar sees. Um, and we can see that that, that um, relative roughness to the radar is directly related to its wavelengths and theta is the incidence angle. So to demonstrate that, what I did is I used the Rayleigh criterion and I um, did a bunch of calculations using Terrasar X, so very short wavelength, um, C-band radar set two and L-band pulsar um, at both a 30 degree and a 50 degree incidence angle. And I calculated this, this H um, statistic. So again, I think about this as how the radar sees the roughness of the surface. And what this tells you is that um, these H values um, represent um, surfaces that the radar would see as smooth. So if we look at Terrasar X, for example, um, any measured surface RMS value that we measure on a, um, an agricultural field, any field that has an H uh, roughness, RMS roughness, less than 0.45 centimeters, Terrasar X sees those surfaces as, as being smooth. And so what that tells us is that most agricultural fields, Terrasar X is going to see as rough. And if we do the same measurement at L-band, so remember our fingertip to our elbow, um, so L-band uh, radar, much longer um, wavelength, lower frequency, um, only surfaces that have a roughness less than 3.4 will be seen by um, Pulsar as being smooth. Um, and incidence angle also has an impact, but you can see it's really the frequency that has the, or wavelength that has the biggest increase. So what does this mean in terms of using radar to, uh, to map soils in agriculture? So to illustrate that, I have a chart on the right-hand side. This is from a paper some time ago where we pulled together RMS measurements of different um, agricultural fields that have been killed in different ways. So we have, for example, Mole board plows, these are plows that invert the soil and create a lot of roughness. So very rough surfaces um, down to um, no-till fields that haven't been tilled. And these are the, um, the RMS uh, roughnesses that have been measured for these fields in centimeters. And then uh, as a reference, I've just um, identified in this chart, Terrasar X, Radar Set 2, and Pulsar. And what using these statistics that I've calculated with H, what this view graph is telling you that for Terrasar X, if I use Terrasar X to map fields with all of these different roughnesses, that Terrasar X is going to view almost all of these fields as being rough. It's going to see them all as a very rough target. And only the very smoothest of fields will appear to be smooth to Terrasar X. And the reverse is true at the reverse is true at L band. So Pulsar is going to see almost all of these fields as being smooth. And it's only the very rough moldboard plow fields that Pulsar would say, oh, this field is different. This is a rough field. Um, radar set two, uh, sort of in between, it sees some fields as smooth and some fields as rough. So what does this tell us? It tells us that if we want to measure roughness, maybe we want to look at something like radar set two because it can see a difference in roughness. Um, based on its, its C-band wavelength. Um, but if we want to mitigate the effects of roughness, L-band um, might be a better choice. And, and I mentioned that earlier that we favor L-band for soil moisture because it mitigates the effect of roughness. All these fields look smooth to pulsar regardless of how, um, how they've been tilled. And L-band also penetrates further into the soil. And let's talk about the second important target parameter that is water. So um, we know that radar is very sensitive to water or moisture in the target. And I just wanted to take a minute to explain why that is. So water is a dipole um, molecule. Um, so it has an oxygen molecule, um, which carries a net negative charge. And it has two hydrogen atoms, which carry 
uh, a net positive charge. So it creates this dipole molecule. And that's important to understand because when we apply um, an electric field, such as microwave signal, um, it, it causes that dipole molecule, that water molecule, to rotate and align itself to the applied field. So this is an important concept because this is how the energy is stored when this microwave signal it interacts with the target. Um, so it's this alignment of this dipole water molecule to the, uh, to the electric field. And I'm gonna talk about why that's important in the next slide. But before I do that, I wanted to just uh, talk a little bit about the dielectric constant. Uh, you will hear this talked a lot about in radar uh, literature. Uh, the, the dielectric constant is a measure of the ease at which this molecule rotates. Um, so if we have um, a, water a water molecule which is not tightly bound and can easily rotate, um, the dielectric constant will be, will be higher. So it's the ease of that rotation of the water molecule that uh, the dielectric constant is measuring. Um, the dielectric constant um, represented by epsilon here, it's a complex number, so it has a permittivity or a real part and a conductivity or an imaginary part. Um, for most soils, the imaginary part is very, very small. Um, only when we get into salty soils do we have a higher imaginary component. And because of that, when we're talking about the dielectric constant in radar remote sensing, we tend to ignore the imaginary part because it is so small. Um, so we tend to talk about the real dielectric constant. So that's what that means when we're when you hear that term that we're referring to just that real part, which is the biggest part of the, the dielectric. And the dielectric um, constant has a big range. Uh, really dry targets have a dielectric of around three. And if we have a lot of water, we're approaching a dielectric of eight. So a really big dynamic range in dielectric. Okay, so we talked about we propagate a wave. Um, it interacts with a water molecule and there is this rotation of a water molecule. So, but what does that mean in terms of uh, radar backscatter? So again, when we apply, apply this electric field, um, any free water, free molecules are going to rotate and align itself to that electric field, positive to negative charge. And I fold it here not tightly bound because some water is bound in the target and clay soils are a good example where a lot of the water is tightly bound to the clay particle itself. So not all water is free water to rotate. Um, but any water that, that is not tightly bound will rotate and align itself. And this is interesting because it's this rotation um, and alignment that stores energy. So we apply a field, the water molecule um, rotates in response to that, and that energy is held. And then when the waves are periodic, so the wave comes and goes, as we know, and when that wave passes, that water molecule will relax and release the energy that was stored. So if there's little uh, frictional resistance, um, most of that water that is stored in that rotation will, will be released when the wave passes. So it's not difficult to understand then, if we have a lot of water molecules in our target, we have a lot of rotation and a lot of energy that is stored. And so a significant amount of energy can be stored and released um, and of course, if there's very little water present to hold the energy, most of that energy um, is going to uh, is going to penetrate and, and be lost. Um, so it's this storing and releasing of the energy that um, uh, that is uh, important in terms of understanding how water uh, affects radar response. So we need water in the target to hold and store the energy, but it's the roughness and the structure of the target that dictates once that energy is released. What is the angular scattering that occurs once that energy is released? And I want to talk about penetration depths. Uh, we talked about the radar frequency or wavelength being important in terms of penetration, which it absolutely is. So that if we have a lower frequency or longer wavelength, we have more penetration. So that is true. But penetration depth also depends on how much water is in the target. So sometimes we get this question, how much or how deep does, does do microwaves penetrate into the soil? And it depends. It depends on the frequency wavelength, the incidence angle, but also how much water. So the penetration depth into a target um, 
is defined by the dielectric, the amount of water, wavelength, and incidence angle. And penetration increases with wavelength, we learned that, um, and is greater when the target, whether it's soil or crop, is drier, so we can get greater penetration. So in most agricultural soils, the penetration is not very deep. And it's only when you get very, very dry targets with very little water. So you can think about desert soils where you would get substantial penetration. And this is just a convenient graph uh, that demonstrates here we're talking about L band. So this is our preferred frequency for soil moisture, about a 23 centimeter from our fingertip to our elbow. And you can see that um, as the soil moisture increases, uh, so most agricultural soils, this moisture will be around between 5% and, and even greater than this 40%, 50%. You can see that it doesn't take very long uh, for the soil moisture to reduce the penetration depth. So if we have um, soils that have 15, 20% soil moisture, the penetration is only um, a few centimeters. Um, vegetation, so we talked about water has to be in the target in order to hold the energy and release the energy and how it's scattered uh, really depends on the roughness when we're talking about soils and the structure when we talk about vegetation. And the scale is, is very different from optical remote sensing. So we're not talking about pigmentation um, or internal leaf structure. Here we're talking about large structures in the uh, the crop canopy. So it's these large structures. You can think about the size, the volume, biomass, the shape, orientation of leaves, stems, and fruit, um, as well as the amount of water in the vegetation that is driving the radar response. So I just draw your attention. Here are just three um, uh, three illustrations of different uh, crops. So this is a soybean crop, a wheat crop, and a corn crop. And, and all you need to to really take away from this is that the structure is very different. The, the size and shape of the leaves are different. The number of leaves are different. Um, how those leaves intersect with the stalk is different. Um, some of the, uh, in this case, this, this wheat crop has a, um, has a head that it's emerged. So this structure is very different. And the radar responds to this structure. And that's why radar is so sensitive to crop type and crop development. because um, And it's not just that between different crop types, we have different structures, but the structure changes as the crop develops as well. And so the radar is responding to these changes in structure um, among different crop types and as the crop uh, develops. And when we think about radar interacting with vegetation and uh, in the structure of, of crop canopies, we have to think um, a little bit like what the radar is experiencing. And we can have all kinds of different um, scattering that occurs in the canopy. And so we'll just take a look at this schematic on the right. Uh, we can, for example, have direct scattering uh, directly from the leaves or direct scattering even from the soil itself. And we can have multiple scattering that occurs um, from leaf to leaf or between the soil and the crop itself. Uh, we're not going to talk in this web webinar about polymetric radar, but um, polymetric radar, which captures the full scattering characteristics of a target, not just its intensity, but also its phase, uh, can really be exploited uh, to take a look at these different types of scattering and the composition of how much direct, uh, multiple, and, and double bounce scattering occurs is really um, uh, can be can be measured by a polymetric radar uh, data set and exploit it to tell us about not just what crop type it is, but what the growth stage is of the crop. I want to finish this part of the webinar talking about some complications we have to keep in mind when we're using radar data. We talk about radar as being an all-weather sensor, but that's not entirely true. So it's true that radar will penetrate through clouds, um, through the small droplets, um, that, that form clouds, um, but that's not true if we have uh, rain with, with large droplets. And depending on the radar frequency, we can get scattering of the radar signal from uh, these rain events, from these, these larger rain uh, droplets. Uh, so what that means is that, yes, radars can see through clouds, but we really need to pay attention to the, the environmental conditions at the exact time that the radar is imaging. And if my radar comes over and at the exact time it's gathering uh, information about my target, it's raining, 
um, this can create a significant amount of scattering that is not related to the target, but related to the scattering from these, these rain droplets. Uh, so what that means is that we should be paying attention to the weather conditions at the time of imaging. Uh, if you have access to rain data, uh, rain gauge data or weather uh, radar data, um, that can be helpful. In some regions of the world, the risk are dire and also there are some times during the day when rain is, is more likely. But do pay attention to that. And if you see um, areas in your image that have, it's a really bright area that doesn't seem to be target related, it could be that that's a rain event that happened uh, at the time of imaging. Um, as well, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about um, freeze thaw. Uh, so we talked about the ease at, with, at which the water molecule will rotate when a microwave, energy, microwave uh, wave is applied. Um, and remember I talked about the water molecule being free to rotate. Um, so if the, you can imagine if the soil is frozen, that soil molecule cannot rotate. And so it, even though there could be a lot of water in the soil, if we apply this electric field, there's no rotation that can occur. The, the water molecule sort of locked in place. And so even though there could be a lot of soil moisture in our soil, the radar will return um, a low response because it doesn't think that there's there's much water in there because there hasn't been any, any energy stored. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful about that. Um, so the dielectric constant can drop to close to zero um, when water changes to a frozen state. Uh, and so that means I'm paying a little bit of attention to um, the temperatures at the time of the image acquisition. So, um, for example, sometimes we acquire data uh, in the early morning hours, so um, 7, 8 a.m. in the morning, and we can have freezing of the soil over the, uh, over the nighttime. Um, and so to mitigate that, if you are imaging at that time of year when you could have frozen soil, you might think about imaging, uh, acquiring an, an image in the, um, the overpass that is coming over in the afternoon or, or early evening. However, this can be an advantage because uh, SAR is able to see a difference between um, the state, the water states between freezing and thawing. So um, it might be something interesting to, uh, to exploit is this uh, freeze thaw state because the radar is going to see those uh, those soils differently. And finally, dew on uh, on the target. So it's just an example of dew that's formed on this leaf. And if we have very humid conditions and a lower temperature overnight, we can get dew that will form on the target. And I've walked through some of these fields many times uh, in the early morning hours, and there is a significant amount of water that sits on, on, on the leaves. And it can take many hours for that water to, uh, to evaporate. So we talked about that um, if we have water in the target, that um, that's going to have an impact on on a radar backscatter. Um, and so if, especially if we're doing any biophysical modeling, such as leaf air index, biomass, for example, and we have uh, dew on our target, you can imagine that's going to create errors in that modeling. Um, so uh, dew is most prominent in temperate regions early in the morning hours. As I said, early in the morning, you walk these fields, you get very wet by walking the fields. Um, so one strategy is to select again, just like free saw, selecting an orbit. Ascending is in the evening, descending is in the morning. Um, so if you think dew is going to be present and you're doing biophysical modeling, you may want to um, think about a select, selecting the, uh, the, um, sorry, the, the ascending orbit in the evening and always check to see what the meteorological conditions are. And I'm gonna finish this webinar just to show a few examples of how um, within my research team and within, within Agriculture Canada, we're using radar data. Uh, so one of the early activities at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada was to develop a method that we could use radar data to map crops across Canada. Uh, so um, this started about 10, 12 years ago, uh, the research. And uh, what we did is we developed a classification methodology that integrates uh, C-band data. At that time, it was uh, Radar Set 2, and now we're moving towards Sentinel-1 as well as RCM. 
uh, but integrating C-band radar data with optical data. Um, and because we're limited to just one frequency C-band, we are also uh, integrating it with optical data. So recall, I showed that image from Manitoba with XC and L-band, a beautiful image to demonstrate that multi-frequency radar does a very good job of crop classification. Um, but this is an operational activity in our department now, and so um, we don't have access to operational X and L bands, so we are integrating C band with optical data. And the, the radar data is really important because we have issues of cloud cover in Canada as well, and the radar data brings that robustness to the classification that we can deliver um, highly accurate maps um, every year. So this is an operational activity now within our department. It's been running for 10 years. Um, you can see in the legend the number of different crop classes that are identified using C-band radar and optical data. Every field across Canada is mapped every year, and the map product is created at a 30 meter resolution. And once the product is um, completed, validated, and the metadata is created for it, these map products are provided free and open uh, for download on the uh, Open Government of Canada Open Data Portal. So this is an operational activity, 10 plus years that this has been running. On the right-hand side, I have a bit of an animation that our operational group has created. It's a really interesting animation. This is uh, one of the Canadian prairie provinces. And what this animation is showing is that between 2009 and 2015, where are soybeans being grown in this Canadian province? And what you can immediately see from this animation is that there's an expansion of soybeans in this Canadian province, and soybeans are being grown further north in Canada than they were um, a few years ago. And there's been, in this part of Canada, there's been about a 40% increase in soybean um, production. That's because the climate is changing. Um, there, the, the frost that, that kills in, in the fall is now later in the fall, and that's giving enough um, growing degree days that producers are able to successfully grow soybeans. So now that we have 10 plus years of um, mapping Canada for different crop types using C-band radar and optical data, we can now take a look at changing cropping pat patterns, um, whether those are driven by market drivers or by uh, climatic change. I mentioned about using uh, radar for soil moisture, which is an excellent tool to do that. Uh, so we've done some work using both um, semi-empirical and empirical models to estimate surface soil moisture. And there are other groups around the world that are uh, developing great methods to use radar data for soil moisture. Uh, we've been applying uh, the integral equation model, which is a physically based model to estimate surface soil moisture. Remember, I mentioned that um, especially using C-band, as we are in Canada, that at C-band, we are estimating just really the surface um, amount of, of water in the soil. Um, but as I said, there are many other really interesting methods that are being developed. Um, so we're running the integral equation model using HH and BV polarization. This is just an output from the IEM model over an area in Western Canada where blue areas are, are um, color-coded to high water content and uh, red and yellow areas have our soils with lower water content. Um, and you can see some pivot irrigation uh, happening in this area where um, the water content is higher. So this is using um, the IEM. It's implemented in SNAP. Uh, it's called the Soil Moisture Toolkit, so you can download that, that plug into SNAP to use the IEM model for soil moisture. So uh, an interesting application of that is irrigation monitoring. So uh, this is um, some work that I did in, in Chile uh, a few years ago. Uh, so now that we can use a physical model or, or some other model uh, using C or L band data for that matter to derive surface soil moisture, what would we do with that kind of information? Uh, there are many reasons we want to estimate soil moisture, but one is to look at irrigation. So Chile has a uh, significant amount of its agricultural land which is irrigated. Um, and so you can imagine with a changing climate, there's a lot of concerns about um, availability of water and applying irrigation when and where it's needed. Uh, so this is uh, just an output from some radar sat data collected over a site in, in Chile. 
And one of the um, high value crops in Chile is, is chicory seedlings. And you can see these tiny little seedlings, very small. These seedlings survive in the very top part of the soil for about 40 days. So they need to be well irrigated in order to survive. So very important crop uh, needing irrigation. And this is just an example I've outlined in black, this chicory field. Uh, so this is using radar set two data um, and applying the IM model. And you can see that on October the, the 20th, um, again, we've color coded it so that oranges and, and uh, yellow are low soil moisture. And you can see on the 20th of October, the soil in this, for this chicory field was, was uh, the moisture was quite low. This producer then irrigated three days later. You can see half of that chili, uh, that, that chicory field has been irrigated uh, and the soils are now very wet and radar set two is detecting that. And then we can see about seven days later, we have this differential drying. So some part of that irrigated field is still wet, probably doesn't need to be irrigated again but um, the northern part of that field is starting to dry and, um, and, and may need some attention in terms of irrigation. Um, we're also uh, working with a Canadian company, um, AUG Signals, uh, to develop a method to uh, use radar data and estimate what the growth stage, uh, what is the growth stage or phenology of a crop. Uh, there are many different reasons we want to know that. In this particular project, it's important to know phenology because phenology can be linked with the, uh, the risk of crop disease. In this project, we were looking at a disease called sclerotinia and canola, and that disease, sclerotinia, feeds on the petals of canola crops. So if the soils are very wet when the canola is flowering, we have risk that this disease could take a foothold and have a devastating effect on canola production. So what we want to do is use radar data to tell us when the canola crop is flowering. Uh, so this is an interesting project. It, it used C and X band data to, and, a, and a machine learning algorithm to use the scattering measured by those radar signals to tell us what is the growth stage of the crop. So this is just a test site in Western Canada. We have four canola fields, four of our test fields. And I'm just going to scroll through this timeline. Um, so on June the 15th, that machine learning algorithm and the scattering measured by X and C band is telling um, us that those four fields are now developing uh, leaves and buds. So it, it, the, canola, the canola crop looks something like this. Um, and it's on the, at the very beginning of July, the 4th of July, that, the, that three out of the four canola fields are now flowering. So that's important because of those three canola fields if the soil is very wet. Uh, and the canola is flowering, these fields would be set up for a higher risk of, of this disease taking a foothold. Um, but we can also monitor when that canola field is um, in its seed development, its pod development stage, and when it's ready for harvest as well. So just keep in mind that this is using machine learning algorithm, it's all radar driven. Uh, we have a paper that's been published on this and um, we tested this over some blind testing over other sites in Canada, and we've demonstrated this approach um, does an excellent job of determining crop uh, phenology. Um, our team is also working on a radar vegetation index. Other teams are doing this as well. Um, and the reason is that normalized different, difference vegetation index is used ubiquitously in precision farming and regional and global crop monitoring. Um, and, but we know that we have issues with cloud cover. Um, and so we're relying on sensors like MODIS, for example, to mitigate uh, cloud cover interference. And we composite seven days of MODIS data to get an estimate of um, the vegetation condition. But the, the challenge with that is that um, these, these uh, national or global um, NDVI monitoring activities um, are producing uh, course resolution data products, so 250, 500 kilometers, for example. So the question then is, can we uh, sort of adapt some of these operational NDVI monitoring activities to use radar data? And so um, our team's been working on this, as I mentioned, and we've developed this radar calibrated NDVI. Um, so we are um, creating a, a statistical relationship between um, uh, radar scattering and NDVI, 
um, in order to create this NDVI-like product, but exclusively derived from our radar data. And in our case, we're coupling that with a crop structure dynamics model, um, which is allowing us uh, to estimate crop condition at field scales and on a daily time step. Uh, so there's a paper here which has uh, now been published, and you can just see that for these canola fields, we are um, monitoring the change in SAR calibrated NDVI over time. But do pay attention in the literature. There are others working in a similar area. And the final example I'm going to show before we close off is um, is, is using uh, radar uh, uh, to look at tracking tillage. Um, so I mentioned that uh, radar sends that the radar sensor will send out a pulse of energy. We know a lot about that. We know the intensity and we know the time that it takes for that pulse of energy to travel to the Earth and go back to the sensor. Um, so what happens if the distance between the sensor and the Earth changes, then the time that it takes that pulse to reach the target and go back to the sensor changes. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, INSAR is a, um, a really mature area of SAR uh, remote sensing, um, but we're starting to look at how we can exploit this change in, in time, change in phase, uh, to look at tillage events. Uh, so tillage is important to monitor because when we till the soil, it destroys the soil structure or, or reduces the soil structure. Um, and it can also create risk of erosion, whether it's wind or water erosion. So we prefer if fields are not tilled, especially um, before rain events or snow melt, so that the soil is protected and, um, and is not susceptible to erosion. Uh, so we have this project uh, that we're working on right now where we're using coherent change detection um, to measure the difference in the phase from one radar pass to another. And we are linking that change in phase uh, to uh, tillage events. And this is just an example of an alert product uh, where we've used um, two Sentinel-1 images we're detecting the difference in, in coherence between one image and another, and all of these white fields, um, this uh, coherent change detection has alerted us that there is change in that field due to a tillage event. So that's my last slide, and I, want, I just want to uh, wrap up and, and thank everyone for attending um, this, this webinar. We've learned a little bit, refreshed ourselves a little bit about the radar basics. We've talked about how radar interacts with soils and crops, and, and we've shown some examples of how in Canada we are applying that. Um, so with that, I'll close off the webinar, and um, we'll be standing by to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Please enter your questions in the Q&A box. We will answer them in the order that they were received. and. We have been assembling them into a Google Doc, which we'll be sharing on screen shortly. And this document uh, will be posted on the training uh, website following the conclusion of this session. If you have any questions about the material presented today, feel free to reach out to Heather McNairn. Her email is on this slide. If you wish to access the recording or the PDF for this session, uh, you can access it through the training webpage um, for this, um, for this uh, particular uh, webinar. Um, information about RSET, please go to the link that you see here. And if you want to keep up to date about RSET trainings, uh, feel free to follow us on social media on Twitter. Thank you very much to all participants. We've been gathering your questions and we will uh, begin our Q&A session. Dr. McNairn is here and she will be answering your questions live. So we've been assembling the Google Doc as you can all see on uh, your screens. And let's just start working our way down. Now uh, we've gotten a uh, great number of questions. So let's start with question number one. Um, there's a problem downloading uh, the file that's listed here. I, all other files are perfectly fine. Are there any ideas about that? <laughs> 
And I think this might pertain, I'm not sure, this might be uh, to session two or session three. Yeah, I, um, I, I was chatting with Laura, who works for me, uh, who will be delivering some of the training next week, and she deferred that to Issa or, or uh, Russ to, to maybe uh, deal with that, but we'll make sure that problem is resolved. Great, thank you. Question two, how can we decide which polarization has to be used for a specific application? So what are the characteristics of the target to decide that? Um, okay, so uh, I just wanted to say as well, there are 50 questions, five zero, that have been posted. I've been busy trying to answer them as best I can, but um, I haven't been able to get through them all. So, um, and some of your questions stumped me a little bit, so I will have to do a little bit of thinking about them, but, um, but the, the questions have been great. Um, so what I've, I've said here is that, um, you know, understanding which polarizations to select for your particular application. Um, you know, we've been working on research for many years, whether it's agriculture or forestry or, um, you know, ice monitoring, et cetera. So uh, this is really uh, driven by um, a lot of empirical research, I'm going to say. Um, and I, I, there's a few questions around polarization that have been um, that have been uh, uh, posted. And I always say, you know, think a little bit about the structure uh, of your crop, uh, or sorry, the structure of your target to, and, and what polarization uh, is being transmitted. Um, and so, for example, I, I'm, I'll talk about vegetation here. Um, we know that the structure of a crop canopy is very complicated. Uh, so we have many leaves and stalks and stems. They interact at they intersect at different angles. The, the canopy is quite complex. Um, and so there's a lot of volume scattering that, that happens. And what that means is that when we transmit a horizontal wave, for example, that horizontally polarized wave will, there'll be a great deal of scattering as that wave interacts with different leaves and stalks and maybe the soil. So there's a lot of scattering that goes on within that target. And this cross-pole uh, uh, polarization, HV or VH, um, is, is really a measure of, um, you know, every time a, a wave is, is scattered, there is a, um, uh, from one sort of unit to another, there's this repolarization of the, uh, the uh, of the transmitted wave. And so this cross-polarization is really sensitive to this multiple scattering, this repolarization of, of the wave because of this, this complicated vegetation target. Um, you know, so we know from a lot of empirical research and we know from sort of the, the physics behind how waves interact um, that something like an HV or VH polarization is going to be sensitive to uh, volume scattering and sensitive to this vegetation. Um, if we think about a vertically polarized wave as well, a lot of uh, crops, for example, have a vertical structure. And so there's sort of this coupling of a vertically polarized wave with that vertical structure. And so we get a lot of scattering back uh, uh, for the, from this vertically transmitted wave. Um, so it makes a lot of sense when you think about how waves are transmitted and, and what the target looks like, what the structure is it looks like. And this has been borne out by a lot of empirical research. So we've done a lot of research, our team and many others, uh, in terms of which polarizations are best for vegetation, for example. And so we know from this, uh, that the physics around this, as well as the empirical research that cross polarization, VH or HV plus VV are the two best polarizations. Um, but your application may be different uh, if you're not looking at vegetation. Um, you know, you have to dig a little bit into the, the literature to see what uh, other researchers have, have come up with. So um, I, I think that, that pretty much answers that question. Great. Uh, let's go on then. Question number three, which polarization among VV and VH is best for mapping inundated rice fields and why? Yeah. Yeah, and so it gets back to a little bit what I was just explaining. So um, uh, if we think about um, the cross-pole polarization VH, uh, which is what this question is talking about. So here we are, we're transmitting a vertically polarized wave and we're, receive, we're 
we're recording how much energy comes back in a horizontal polarization. So, you know, we have this, this multiple scattering um, effect going on. Um, in this particular case, for example, because we have a flooded vegetation, we have this, this double bounce mechanism that, that is occurring. So what we've seen, again, like I was just saying, you know, the physics behind it makes a great deal of sense that if we have, uh, you know, vegetation that is inundated, we get this double bounce um, uh, mechanism set up. And so, you know, VH is the, it, you know, tends to um, be able to identify these inundated, um, these inundated targets the best. I also made a note here, though, um, you know, both HV and BH can be used to model the amount of biomass, so whether that's rice or or any other um, or any other uh, crop biomass. So uh, even though HV may be the best at, at sort of isolating these inundated fields, um, BV could also be useful perhaps in in modeling the the total amount of bio, rice biomass. Great. Question number four, it's it's not very clear. I don't know if you want to try to take a stab at that. Is is there a resource that provides information on crop type and the type of band, or does it change during the crop phenology? I think what they mean is, is, is there a guideline that you should use a given band for given crops, or does that change as with crop phenology? Yeah, so... Um... Okay, so I'm going to break this down into talking about, I must have missed this question, sorry about that. I'm, I'm going to ba break this down to think about the radar frequency or, or wavelength and the polarization. The polarization is a bit easier, so we were just talking about HV um, or VH, the cross pole, VV and, and H, uh, uh, VV and HH, for example. So that, that one's a little bit clearer. What our research is showing is that uh, regardless of the crop type, wheat or corn or soybeans, for example, that cross polarization HV or VH um, is the is the most sensitive to um, crop type and 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 biomass and leaker index, all all of those things. So that's the single most important um, polarization. As I was just mentioning, VV also contributes and has information um, in terms of uh, crop type. Uh, so that recommendation does not really change uh, for the crop type or even the growth stage. It's the pull, it's the it's the radar frequency or wavelength that is a bit more complicated. And there were some other questions about this as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, you have to think about um, the size of the canopy, and you have to think about in the size of the canopy varies depending on the crop type and the, and the growth stage. Uh, so you can think about a corn canopy versus a soybean canopy. So the amount of biomass is quite different between those two. And even a corn canopy, the biomass is not the same through the entire growing season. So, you know, that canopy starts out quite small and accumulates biomass as the crop grows. Um, and in that case, you know, we want to think a little bit about the penetration depth of the uh, microwave relative to the biomass. Um, and so our, the rule of thumb is that you want enough of, you want the wave to penetrate enough into the canopy itself and create all these multiple scattering events. Um, but you don't want the, you know, you don't want the penetration to be so, uh, so deep into the canopy that we get these contributions from the soil. Um, and so you have to match the frequency or, or wavelength to the, can the size of the canopy. So we generally, you know, we think about recommending, you know, longer wavelengths uh, to be able to map and monitor larger biomass crops like corn, but, you know, shorter wavelengths to map and monitor lower biomass crops like soybeans, for example. Um, and that makes it complicated because in an agricultural landscape, you have many different crop types. Um, and, and in that case, this is why this multi-frequency um, approach is, is the best because, um, you know, the L-band wave length, for example, might be, a, might be able to map uh, cornfields really well, whereas the X-band uh, wave may be better at um, mapping smaller biomass crops. So, 
that's why, you know, integrating different frequencies, especially when we're looking at crop mapping um, and knowing that biomass changes over the whole growth cycle, you know, this is why that we have this richness of data when we combine um, radars at different uh, frequencies. Great, thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. These are complicated answers, I'm sorry. <laughs> Long uh, answer. Question, question number five. Uh, when would you use ground range instead of slant range? Um, yeah, so, you know, I'm just saying here that, you know, it's convenient to, uh, to do our slant to ground range conversion when we want to stack data together. Um, and especially if we're going to integrate data with other geospatial data. So, for example, if you have uh, field data, training data that you want to do a classification in, that training data will be georeferenced. Um, and so doing this slant to ground range conversion um, is really helpful to stack all of our images together as well as any other geospatial data that, um, you know, that, that we need in our either classification or in our modeling. And I just mentioned here too, like the examples I showed are probably not as dramatic as, as what you might see um, in other radar products. Uh, if you look at airborne uh, data collected, uh, radar data collected by airborne systems, you will see a really significant compression because the, you know, the incidence angle changes a lot from near to far range. Or if you have satellite imagery where you have really wide swaths like Scansar, um, the level of compression is is quite noticeable, and and you would really appreciate if you looked at airborne data why you need to do this slant to ground range conversion. Okay, moving on then to the next question. Um, someone is not clear about the incident angle concept. Uh, so if yeah. you could please explain more. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So maybe I'll just, uh, I just want to get this right. So I'll just read my answer here. Um, so as I was saying in the presentation, you know, regardless of the target, um, whether it's a smooth target or rough target, we have this, this, uh, as the incidence angle increases, um, we have this, this decrease in, in, in backscatter. And, um, I didn't show it in the presentation, but there's a something called the, the radar equation. And when you look at the radar equation, which really characterizes how energy is propagated and how it, how it interacts and returns to the target, um, part of the reason that we have this decrease in backscatter um, is, is due to the fact that as the, the power that's generated by the antenna as it hits the target, there is a decrease in range and distance um, in, in, in the power that, that sort of interacts with uh, with the target. Um, and there's also a spreading loss of energy as we increase our distance from the radar antenna. And so fundamentally, there's just less energy that that comes to the target the farther away the target is from the antenna. And if we recall that, you know, incidence angle increases with range or distance from the antenna, um, and that's why we see just fundamentally this decrease in, in um, energy that's scattered back because we're transmitting less energy to those targets that are further away. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not this, you know, that that's sort of the fundamental mechanism. But, you know, you saw that that function is a little bit different depending on the roughness. And we talked about a little bit further in the in the, the webinar that uh, if we have rough surfaces, we have a lot of uh, scattering in many different directions. And so, although even for rough surfaces, we have um, less scattering occurring as angle increases because we have this scattering in rough surfaces in many different, different directions, fundamentally you have more scattering um, coming back to the radar antenna. So I hope that answers that question. Okay, moving on then to question number seven. Uh, please um, say something about the software used to convert from slant to ground range. Yeah, and I, I just uh, noted here that I think on Thursday uh, will be the webinar on how do you snap. Um, so that's the next series in the RSAT training. Um, and there is a process uh, in SNAP, and I just listed it here. Um, if you look under the radar uh, menu um, and on under geometric, there is a slant to ground range conversion. 
Great. Question number eight, what are the differences between modes in Sentinel-1? So the four different modes that you mentioned. Yeah, I thought it was probably best here. I just provided a web link here uh, to ESA where they describe um, not only the characteristics of the different modes, but how they are generated from the, the Sentinel uh, from the Sentinel satellite. Um, and I just made a note here that in our work in agriculture, we're using the, um, the interferometric wide mode um, because it gives a good trade-off between uh, swath width and, and resolution. And we're able to, uh, to acquire these two important polarizations, VB and VH. Okay, question number nine. What's the difference between power and intensity? Yeah, and I just I, I noted here that um, you know in in the radar literature um, because radar is you know it's it's you know its genesis is is really in physics and engineering and there are many of us in in other domains that uh, that are using it. There's sometimes the there's an interchangeability of terminology depending on whether um, uh, it's coming from an engineering source or maybe from an application source. So just be aware of that. But uh, I just noted here that intensity is the power that's transmitted per, per unit area. So you can think of those two um, terms. Uh, uh, they're directly related in that way. All right, question number 10. For multi-temporal analysis and change detection, in the case of forests, it'll work for detecting short time disturbances to avoid significant incident angles. If we want to monitor disturbances over many years, might we get a different incident angle due to the growth of the forest? Oh, I think I may, I'm not sure if I understood this question then. Um, uh, okay, I, I thought the question was about, you know, using different incidents angles over if you're doing long-term monitoring. Do I have that correct or? Yes, correct, correct. Okay. So um, as I'm saying here that we always have to think about the fact that we want to measure a difference in the target. So in this case, a, a forest canopy. So whatever the radar measures, we want that change in, in, in intensity that's measured by the radar. We want it to be related to the target itself. So we don't want to be mixing in changes in intensity because the the radar um, data that we're using, the configuration is changing. Um, and that's what we're doing if we're mixing in incidence angles, as we talked about uh, just previously. So, um, you know, so that means that whether it's a short-term monitoring or long-term monitoring, um, if the incidence angle, if the, the different products we're integrating, if the incidence angle is, is different from one product to another, um, some of the uh, differences we're seeing are due to that incidence angle effect. So it, it's, you know, it's really best to try to stick with uh, one incidence angle, which typically in radar means a repeat um, where we're, we're uh, collecting uh, um, the exact same um, repeat mode of a, of a, of a SAR, uh, of a SAR um, satellite. However, uh, and I'm just going to talk about agriculture here rather than forestry. Um, you know, what I was just mentioning is more about looking at change detection. So looking at changes in intensity over time and relating them to the target, not to the radar uh, change in the radar configuration itself. There are there are modelings. I'm, I'm not that familiar with forestry, but in, in agriculture, we use, uh, for example, something called the water cloud model, uh, which is a semi-empirical model. And if you have a model like that, like the water cloud model, um, incidence angle is parameterized in that model. Um, and because of that, uh, you can integrate different um, radar modes with different incidence angles in the model. And we do that, we've done that quite a bit to retrieve biomass or leaf area index um, from radar data by using the water cloud model. And, and there we're using radar different incidence angles. And so the radar incidence angle uh, we know what that is from the radar product and, and it's fed into the water cloud model. So if you have a, a model that has its incidence angle as a parameter, it can be, uh, you know, that's a case where you can definitely integrate radar that's been collected at different angles 
Okay, question number 11. Why is the Doppler shift only important for side-looking radars? Uh, okay, so um, uh, again, I hope I understood the question here, but my response here is that you know all radar instruments are side-looking instruments, um, and the Doppler shift is a, is a phenomenon. It's not specific to you know to radars per se. This is a phenomenon that that we see all around us. That when the power when power is transmitted and the source of the power is moving, we get these shifts. Um, but in radar, it's you know it was just something that was uh, that we use uh, to create this synthetic larger um, radar aperture by recording the history of, of these shifts. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Good, yeah. Okay, the next question, number twelve. On slide 32, the write-up and the contents on the image are not matching. When approaching the target, do we have a negative or a positive shift? Yeah, I was looking at that during the presentation, and um, I'm going to uh, look back at that diagram that I used. I pulled that off of a, a, the, a site from, Can that, uh, from a Canadian source here, so I'm going to take a look at that again. Um, but just and sometimes in, it depends on the point of reference. So um, I showed that example of the bug and the bug moving on the pond. And so I, I always think about the, you know, the, the Doppler shift relative to the observer. Um, and I'm not sure if that, you know, I, I was mixing up maybe those references. But, you know, let's focus on thinking about the Doppler shift relative to the observer. So think about yourself. You know, like I said, the bug moving towards you as you're standing on the, the shore. And in that case, the frequency, it's an upward shift with respect to the observer because the source of the pulses of, of energy is approaching the observer. And so you get more um, pulses per unit that are hitting the observer. So um, I apologize for that if that was a bit confusing. Okay, question number 13. That's a loaded question. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was you see, I pointed to NASA for that one. <laughs> um, there are some great books. Um, Ulubi is pretty is the bible of that. How so? How is uh, synthetic aperture? Im, how are images reconstructed from radar signals? What is the mathematics behind this process? Yeah. So I, I you know, uh, again, apologies. I don't have a, a engineering background. Um, but I really like, I'm just going to say I really like these types of questions because even for somebody like myself, it really makes me um, dig and dig in and try to understand the physics and the engineering behind it. So, um, you know, Erica, maybe you can provide some reference material that uh, could, could answer that. But these are great questions. I, I really like the probing questions. Yeah, so we will be posting this document on the RSET training webpage and um, I can include some references for this question. Okay, yeah. so the next one. Can you explain better not and gamma not again, please? Uh, okay, so I, I hope I can clarify this. And I'll just say up front, if anyone has, if, if the question, answers I have provided aren't clear, you know, you can d directly contact me and I will try to explain better um, if, if they're not clear. Uh, so as I was saying, beta naught is the reflectivity or the intensity of, of energy per unit area. Um, so you can think about, for example, a one by one meter area. What is the, you know, the intensity of energy in that one by one meter area? But here we're thinking about it in the slant range projection, or which is the natural view and geometry. Um, but we can transfer beta naught to gamma naught um, if we think it's advantageous and advantageous to represent the reflectivity energy per uh, one by by one by one meter square. Um, if we think it's advantageous to present that in the plane that's perpendicular to the slant range. So I wanted to put all of these in the training, beta naught, gamma naught, sigma naught, because you will come across these in the literature. Um, and some researchers do use gamma naught um, rather than sigma naught. But um, especially in the agriculture domain, you will, you know, most, most often you will, uh, you know, users and researchers are transforming beta naught to, uh, to gamma naught. So that's the amount of energy per unit area on the ground range, like an agricultural field. 
Okay. So the next question, number 15, how can we integrate both coherence and intensity to map flooded vegetation using random forest? So uh, I think it's next week, uh, you will be introduced to random forest classification specifically for crop mapping, but it, this can be applied in this scenario as well. So, you know, the random forest is a, you know, a, a great way to integrate these different types of, of data. Um, so hopefully next week when you see that training, you can see that the random forest, forest classifier is able to integrate um, many different types of data, um, including coherence and intensity. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, question 16. Is the speckle, um, if it's very high, is the speckle related noise very high in soil moisture related data and how do you reduce it in such cases? So, you know, speckle is a fundamental characteristic of all radar systems. Um, so we have to deal with it no matter what the application uh, is. Um, so yes, uh, you will encounter that if you're using radar data for soil moisture retrieval. Um, there are a few ways to reduce noise and you're going to learn about that in the next RSET training as well. Um, multi, uh, selecting a multi-look product or multi-looking it yourself is, is one way to reduce that noise as I mentioned, but remember you're compromising on the resolution as well. Um, most, most commonly we apply some sort of radar adaptive filter to spatially average the image. And as I said, I think you're going to learn a lot more about that next week about how to do that. Okay, question 17, how does multi-look, or what does multi-look mean in physical terms? And how does the multi-look process compromise the resolution? Yeah, I, I think what I'm gonna do in this one, Eric, is I'll, I'll, I'll look into some of the engineering literature because I think that's where we're gonna find maybe a more detailed explanation of that. So if you don't mind, I will dig into that and provide some references. Sure, that sounds great. And then question number 18, is there a Python 3.x library to process Sentinel-1 data other than SNAP? I think this is for one of the um, uh, other sessions in the series. Yeah, I, yeah I, again, I was chatting with my AFC team uh, to clarify some of these questions and I was told we don't use this. So um, hopefully this is a question you can repost during the training. Um, uh, the next uh, RSET training uh, sessions. Right. right, okay. Question number 19, is there significant impact in images formed by different polarizations, HH, HB, VH, VB? Uh, yeah, so again, hopefully I understand this question. So absolutely. So um, once you start to work with radar data and you, uh, you know, you can display an HH cross pull and VB image, you're going to see that the intensity that you see uh, from amongst those different polarizations will be quite different. Um, it's very target specific. So whether it's forestry or agriculture wetlands, um, you will have to you know, do some um, investigating of that for your own application. But as I said, always think about you know, how that energy is, the polarization and, and how that energy is, is propagated um, and, and what is the structure of of the target um, and, and that's why you're going to see those changes but it's they're there and we exploit that to be able to differentiate from one target to another. Okay um, question 20 how can we take care of the geometric geometric distortions that you mentioned um, in areas of complex topography? So I'm going to give a brief answer and then Erica I was hoping you probably have more experience in this I mean it's a challenging uh, topography to use SAR in and you can apply DM to do ortho, ortho rectification for sure but the intensity is, is distorted because of these layover and foreshortening impacts um, selecting different orbits like ascending descending you may have a different look at the target because of the the orbit um, especially if you have radar shadows, uh, if depending on how the target lines up with the uh, the, the radar um, antenna, you might be able to get a different look at the target. 
but I don't know, Erica, if you had something you wanted to add to that. No, not really. I mean, usually what I prefer, especially in areas that have shadows, is just to create a mask of the shadows, because I find that um, applying different methods to try to fill in those shadows, um, it's never perfect. And so uh, there, there are always some issues. So I'd just rather just treat it as no data. All right, the next one. Can you explain the difference between single and dual polarization? Uh, yep, so single polarization is, is simply we trans the, the radar antenna transmits one polarization and receives one. So it could be H, transmit H or Z, for example. But some radar antennas can, can transmit two polarizations at a time and or receive two polarizations at a time. So an example would be a radar that is uh, collecting data in HH and HV. Okay, question number 22, how can we retrieve plant biophysical variables from Sentinel-1 radar? Uh, so that's not a straightforward answer because there are a lot of different researchers using different methods. Um, so of course there's a lot of empirical research where we, you collect field data and you create some sort of statist statistical model between the biophysical parameter and the radar response. Um, I mentioned before that we've done a lot of work with the water cloud model um, and I can provide lots of references for that. Uh, where we can retrieve LAI, um, vegetation water content, or biomass using the water cloud model. Um, but there's also a lot of work being done now on, um, you know, machine learning type of algorithms uh, to retrieve, um, you know, LAI biomass, et cetera. So um, there's, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways of doing that. They all have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, you know, the water cloud model, if you want to retrieve LAI and biomass, you also have to be able to retrieve soil moisture because that's also a component of the water cloud model. So you have to have a way to, to estimate soil moisture, either through the model or by ancillary data. Um, machine learning methods in all application areas um, are being widely studied, but they're very data driven. And the success of a machine learning algorithm really depends on the quality and, and representativeness of the training data. But I, I have a few papers I can share about that. Super. Okay, how about two more questions? Um, question 23, waves with higher frequencies have higher energy. So these should be able to penetrate deeper compared to shorter frequencies. But on slide number 42, it is stated that longer wavelengths penetrate deeper. Can you please clarify? Yeah, I was, I, I'm going to answer this. And Erica, if you have a better answer to this, please let me know. I, I, as I said, these kind of questions I find really interesting because I'm like, yeah, it's, uh, uh, um, this is, uh, this is a, um, a valid physics um, representation and um, but the, the you know we know uh, absolutely that longer longer wavelengths will penetrate further into a soil or into a crop canopy and I was thinking about this question and and you know penetration is also impacted by the size of the wave relative to the scatterer and so um, if you think about an L band wavelength for example that could be 20 centimeters long and we have a you know a small uh, a canopy with very small leaves on it, um, those leaves are not going to create scattering from that L-band uh, wavelength. But I don't know, Eric, if you had a better answer than that. No, that was great, Heather. Okay. So how about then the last question here? Um, how deep can the radar signal penetrate into the soil? Uh, so this is not a straightforward answer either because um, it's going to depend on the radar wavelength. We just talked about that in the previous um, in the previous question. So um, X band, C band, L band all have um, different penetration depths, and it depends on the instance angle uh, as well as we saw. Um, and it so those are the SAR characteristics that drive penetration depth, but it also depends on how much water is in the soil. 
or in the target in general. And so, um, you know, scattering will happen once we have, uh, you know, at this sort of discontinuity where we have, uh, you know, water present in the target. So as soon as the radar wave, you know, encounters uh, water in the target, scattering starts. Um, and so soils that have a lot of water in it, the penetration depth is less. Uh, so just to recap, you know, longer wavelengths, L-band will penetrate further than X-band. Um, incidence angle will also impact penetration depth. And if we have a, a very dry soil, the wave will penetrate further than if we have a very uh, wet soil. Um, but we do know, just as a general comment, that we, you know, we favor longer wavelengths like L-band for soil moisture retrieval. And the penetration is, is a few centimeters in agricultural soils where we do have water present, usually. Okay, so let's um, stop it there since we're already past our time. Um, I would like to remind everyone that the second session will be on Thursday, and we will have Fabrizio Ramoino and Magdalena Friedrich from the European Space Agency presenting on how to process Sentinel-2 data using the SNAP uh, toolbox, and they will provide a refresher on optical processing optical data. So with that, um, thank you all very much for attending, and thank you, uh, Dr. McNairn, for your excellent presentation and for handling all these questions. There are quite a number of questions that we didn't get to, but we will answer those on the document and put it on the RSET web page. Um, Heather, any closing words before we close the session? No, not not uh, not really, Erica. Just thanks for the opportunity. And and as I said, if uh, we didn't, uh, if I didn't adequately answer your question, uh, please reach out to me. Some of your questions will be answered in the next uh, RSET training sessions. Okay, super. So. Thanks, everyone, and wishing you all a great day. Bye-bye.